Well, good morning, Four Corners. My name is Daniel Bailey, and I'm an elder candidate here at Four Corners, and it's been my uh, just pleasure and what a blessing for me to have some time this week to prepare a message for all of you. Uh, If you're visiting here at Four Corners, it's not our custom to parachute into a passage as we'll do this morning. We've been on a long journey through Exodus, perhaps not as long as the Israelites took, uh, but we've been walking steadily through the book of Exodus. And when we take brief uh, breaks from Exodus, Trey's got us walking through Philippians. But today, we will hear from Peter. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, that will be our text this morning. There's much we could say about Peter. He's a fisherman by trade, a a family businessman. He fished with his brother as well as some of his friends. And Christ called Peter out of that trade of fishing to become a fisher of man. And from that point forward, Peter was one of the 12 disciples, perhaps one of the most prominent of the disciples, and plays a big role within the Gospels, often seen as kind of the spokesman for the other disciples. Perhaps most significantly, Peter is the first of the disciples to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Christ's calling of Peter Uh, was that he would be the rock, the one that the church would be built upon. So from the very early calling of Peter, his lifelong ministry would be focused on the church. He wasn't a perfect man, as we all know well. We often see him acting rashly. You may even say somewhat immaturely in the Gospels. And we're given painful detail about what had to be the lowest moments of Peter's life. As in Christ's hour of need, Peter denied his Savior three times out of fear of man. Following Christ's resurrection and ascension, Peter went on to be one of the prominent leaders of the early church. Still imperfectly, I might add, uh, having to be confronted at times by Paul. But what we have in the word from Peter are two books, First and Second Peter, written likely in the 8060s towards the end of Peter's life, likely the last five or 10 years of Peter's life. And what we have on these wonderful books of the church are a practical and stirring encouragement to the church, a loving set of letters to the church from a wise man, a seasoned pastor who he himself would soon give his life for the gospel. So if you would, please stand with me and we'll read our text Today from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. It says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you sovereignly call us all sinners, God, that you call us unto yourself, God, that you give us such a grace, even the grace of being here together this morning to hear from your word. God, for those in you, you have opened up our eyes that you have made what was dead alive through the blood of Jesus Christ, God. And so as we approach your word this morning to hear from your Holy Spirit through Peter, God, May it um, prick our hearts, God. May it convict us of the many areas where we fail to be like Christ. God, and may the power of your spirit be at work in each life here today. Help clear our minds and focus on what you would have us here this morning for your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
So the title of our sermon this morning is Stewards of God's Varied Grace. And Lord willing, we'll cover three points here. The sobering motivation, the loving action, and we'll close with the glorious outcome. So let's start with the sobering motivation and look with me here at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter starts here with the coming end of all things, and he seems to say it in a pretty matter-of-fact way. We often shy away from these types of topics, eschatology, end times, what the future holds, who knows? We throw up our hands, who knows? But interestingly, the authors of the Bible do not shy away from this topic. It's a theme from the Old Testament prophets all the way through John's revelation, and it's consistently used by these inspired authors to encourage and motivate God's people. And this is precisely what Peter is doing here. The end of all things is at hand, is what he says. So what could Peter be referring to? Well, some would take this statement to say that Peter was looking in the 8060s to the coming destruction of the temple in 8070, just a few years later, or the destruction of Jerusalem, or perhaps the uh, upcoming persecution of the church under Emperor Nero, whom Peter himself would lose his life, is what tra tradition holds under, under Nero, that he would be crucified. But to me, this explanation is, is not very convincing. Why would Peter say that the end of all things is at hand if he were referring to the temple or some of the Jewish practices and customs? If he were referring to the persecution that the church would soon face, why would he say the end of all things is at hand? The church by this point was already undergoing persecution. We can read that in Acts, in the early parts of Acts. Sure, that the fever pitch of the persecution would rise, but it was already ongoing. I think a straightforward reading of this text is appropriate. The end of the present age is coming. Here's a couple of things that we know. Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse said that he would come again. That all the tribes of the earth would see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. At the ascension when Jesus rose up into heaven, his disciples were gathered around, presumably looking up into the heavens, trying to spot Jesus as he got smaller and smaller and smaller. And what happened? Two angels appeared and they said, men of Galilee, why, why are you looking up in the, in the heavens for Jesus? The man who went up there into heaven, the God man who went up into heaven will come down in the same way that he just ascended. These aren't nice just pictures or analogies. Christians, we are awaiting the coming return of our Messiah. The early church was looking forward to this. The coming of all things is at, the end of all things is at hand, and this includes the coming, the physical return of Christ. But you might say, Peter says the ending of all things. That doesn't really fully answer the question. Well, Peter perhaps addresses this more directly at the end of his second letter in 2 Peter when he describes the dissolution of the world and the heavens and the exposure of all the works that are done on them. He says this in 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness. The end of all things is at hand. The way of the earth, the way of the heavens, these things will be dissolved and all of our hidden works will be exposed. The finitude of the current age is a source of great motivation for the believer. Peter's eyes throughout his writings are set on the end. To the suffering, he says, hold on a little while longer. Christ will return and bring with him your salvation, a salvation that the angels long to look in. To the weary elders, he gives them the encouragement to faithfully continue to shepherd because the great shepherd, Christ himself, will appear and bring with him the unfading crown of glory. 
to the church. He says to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And at the appropriate time, God himself will be the one who exalts you. You know, thinking about the end is not just something we do as Christians. It's a common source of motivation. How many times do you see a sports team in the fourth quarter raise up a four? As if to signify to themselves and their teammates, the end is coming. There's not much time left. There's no need to conserve resources. There's no need to hold back. We're almost there. The end is almost there. Give it everything you've got. Or the marathon runner approaching the 26th mile, the last mile, no longer holds back, no longer bides their time, but they run as if to win the race. So believers, we are facing the end of the times. You know, we have so many to-do lists, one day, one day list, one day I'm gonna volunteer in the kids' ministry, one day when I have more time, one day when things settle down, I'm gonna have some folks over, maybe once we clean out the house a little bit, we'll be more hospitable. One day we'll start doing family worship, one day, one day, one day. But when the buzzer sounds, all of the things that we have on the one day list will be permanently transferred to the forever undone list. That's new covenant believers. We live at the end of the age. We live at the 11th hour. Our savior is returning for his people and his kingdom. What sort of people ought we to be? What a sobering motivation. And Peter clearly here gives us the next step. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Sometimes the most basic questions of God's word can be the most fruitful. For the sake of our prayers. Be disciplined for the sake of our prayers. Wow, that sounds like our prayers might be important. It sounds like your prayers, that those are individual, that we all have prayers. Prayer has an S on it, meaning it's plural, that we have many prayers. Peter seems to assume here that prayer is a fundamental action of his believing readers. Are we bathing every thought, every action in prayer? Praying at all times in the spirit, devoting ourselves to prayer, praying without ceasing? The athlete disciplines the mind and the body for the race. But here Peter says that we are to discipline our minds and our bodies for the sake of prayer. You know, the effectiveness of our prayers matter. Peter draws this connection here between self-control and sober-mindedness and the outcomes of our prayers. Heaven forbid we be a people that sits back and says, it'll be what it'll be. It is what it is. Is that how Christ taught us to pray? Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. It is what it is. Amen. Of course not. Sure, we look at God's sovereignty and we have great promises from the word that God will accomplish all of his plans and purposes. Amen. But how does he do that? How does he accomplish those things? Is it not through the alert, believing action of his creatures, his creation? Is that not what Christ showed us as he prayed fervently for the church and fervently for the Lord to work? We are called to alertness, Peter says. Peter says to be watchful and alert, that the devil, our adversary, roars around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. As a final note here, in a worldly sense, we often think about discipline and self-control as kind of the key the cornerstones of success, right? I, along with, I know many of the men in our church have read contemporary authors who preach this kind of secular, military-esque way of conducting life in order to be successful. But this is the opposite of what Peter's saying here. He's not saying be self-controlled and disciplined so that you can go out there and be successful. He's saying be self-controlled, be disciplined, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, and what are prayers rather than an acknowledgement that we are dependent on a living God? So if you want to wake up at 4.30 on the dot every morning, rain or shine, do it. Praise God. But don't do it so that you can hustle more than the next guy. 
Do it so that you can hit your knees in alert prayer to an all-powerful God. Believers, when we rightly see the coming end of this age, we control our bodies, we control our minds for alert prayer unto the Lord. Peter then moves on here to hospitality. He teaches us that the end of all things is at hand, that we are to be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of our prayers, And he moves on to loving action, including hospitality. So let's look next to uh, the loving action, our second point. For that, we'll read uh, verses 8 through 11. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So let's dive in here. Above all, we are to earnestly love one another. This is the loving action. Love is the driving force of everything that we do as believers. And before we get into the specific actions that we are to take, the Holy Spirit here points us towards the heart behind those actions. It's not to say the action's not important but we're to be thoughtful of the heart behind the action. And here Peter reminds us that love itself covers a multitude of sins. This is the truth at the core of the gospel. This is of what it means to be a fellowship of Christians, of believers. This is what binds us together. Love covers sins. It forgives sins. It doesn't agitate or stir up sins. It covers them. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ means that we bear with one another. We bear with one another's burdens. When we have complaints against one another, we forgive one another. Paul says, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. This is why Christian community is fundamentally different from any other type of family or gathering. The love here that Peter is pointing to Above all, keep loving one another. It's a love between Christians. Sure, you could extend it to others and to the world. Yes, but that's not what he's specifically speaking to. It's a love between Christians. And in love, and truly only in love, can we practice hospitality. Peter gives us this great example of love in action, hospitality. But you might say, wait, that seems like a bit of a divergence. So we're talking with all this lofty language, the end is coming, be sober-minded for prayers, love one another, be hospitable, and then be good stewards of God's varied grace. Doesn't hospitality feel a little weird in that list of lofty things? Why is Peter using such elevated language around hospitality? Well, he's not the first to do so. This is a theme throughout scriptures. In fact, Paul writes in Titus and 1 Timothy that if a man seeks to be an overseer, a shepherd, an elder of God's people, he must be hospitable. It's a requirement to shepherd God's people. Clearly, there's more going on here than dinner parties and social clubs. The theme of hospitality emerges early in the Bible in Genesis with Abraham Abraham entertaining strangers, preparing for them a meal, and in doing so, actually entertains the Lord himself. This is what the author of Hebrews points back to when he says in Hebrews 13, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Like what? What? Entertaining angels through hospitality? Here we have a very... Parallel text to what we're looking at. Brotherly love leads to hospitality. We see it practiced throughout Acts. If you want a theology of the home, just look at where the word home or house is is spoken about in the book of Acts. They went from house to house. There was not a needy person amongst them gathering in homes to pray. The whole, the setting of so much of the book of Acts is under this banner of hospitality. And Christ himself gives us this lofty picture of hospitality as a depiction of the final judgment 
In Matthew 25, verses 34 and following, he says this, describing when the believers will be separated from the unbelievers, he says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Little hospitality right there, isn't it? He's prepared the kingdom that he's inviting others into. And he says it for this reason. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and you and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, God's people, you did it to me. Hospitality, rightly understood, is a love of others as ourselves through the giving of ourselves, our time, our attention, our possessions for the benefit of of others. Hospitality is not an afterthought, and it's not a unique calling. It's not like, hey, I've got it, or I don't have it. It's for all of us. How can you be more hospitable to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Here at Four Corners, we have gospel community groups as a way of getting together throughout the week with a smaller group of people to practice hospitality, to encourage one another, and pray one another with one another. That might be an opportunity. That's great, but there are so many ways for us to be hospitable. This extends in so many directions. Take a family to lunch after church. Help greet or help serve coffee. That's a blessing to everyone when you serve the coffee here. I know it is to me. Have a family over to your house one evening. These things that are seemingly mundane, seemingly common and temporal, Peter elevates them as the rest of the uh, scriptures do to something that is a great calling and service to the Lord. When we love one another, show, showing hospitality, we serve one another through God's varied graces. So let's talk more on these varied graces. Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied, or I like the older older translation, manifold graces. We may have too narrow of a definition of the word grace. We commonly think of grace as God's undeserved or unmerited favor toward salvation. And this is a great definition. Amen. When we think of grace, our mind goes to Romans, as we've been recently as a church, that we are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We think about how grace is unmerited, Paul says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And these are great and glorious truths. They're the very nature of our salvation, the very reason for our hope and our joy. Every single person in the family of God, every single one of you with your names written in the books of life have received this grace. And we often stop there in our thinking of what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor for salvation, yes and amen, but the word of God extends our conception of grace to include the individual fitting and empowering of believers for the service of others to the glory of God. This isn't limiting our view of grace, and it's not adding to what it takes to be justified before the Lord. Don't hear me say that, but do hear me say when we see grace as salvific and the empowering of God's believers, we start to break down these silly notions that there is a spiritual realm to our life distinct and separate from the temporal or the common. It can be so easy for us to think worldly thoughts about the futility of our lives. As if work, mowing the lawn, serving in the kids' ministry, going to group on a Wednesday night, as if these things ultimately just don't matter that much. They're futile. Belief in Christ for grace, yes, I I see that, but what I do with my finances, I mean, you can't take it with you, right? 
We as believers, Peter says, have been ransomed from the futility of life that we inherited from our forefathers. He says that in chapter 1. So apart from Christ, sure, it doesn't matter how you spend your money. Perhaps I could agree with you somewhat there. Oh, but in Christ, his precious blood, being more precious than any silver or gold, the blood as a spotless lamb has ransomed, has redeemed our time, has taken us out of that futility. Our lives are not futile, believers. They're of great eternal importance. So what are these gifts that come from God's very grace? Many of you might think, just directly, hey, spiritual gifts. Isn't this a spiritual gift? Isn't that what he's referring to, to here? And we do have these lists throughout the New Testament. There's five lists, if you include this passage. There's five lists of what are commonly called spiritual gifts. We most recently went through the list in Romans 12 as a church. But there are also lists in 1 Corinthians, a couple, and, and Ephesians. But if you look at these lists, not every single gift in in all of the lists are included in, in any one list. There's not a comprehensive list of gifts. And I think we can conclude from that that the New Testament doesn't give us this checkbox list of what the gifts of God's varied grace are. Let me give you an example. If I were to ask you, what's the best places to eat in Atlanta? And you shot me a quick text with three restaurants and then later you followed up with an email and it had one of those restaurants with seven more I wouldn't conclude that you've given me all the best places, a distinct and comprehensive category of all the best restaurants. Plus, there's so many variations, right? When you said such and such burger, did you mean the Marietta location or the Al Alpharetta location or they got a food truck now in Decatur? Which one did you mean? I wouldn't assume those things, right? So let me propose a broader definition of how we think of gifts here. That which you have and that which you can do. What you have and what you can do. Do you have 10 more years to live? That's a gift. Do you have a skill or a trade? That's a gift. Do you have money? That's a gift. Do you have a house? That's a gift. Are you good at facilitating gospel community group discussions? Do you have time for the garden out there? Do you write letters of encouragement? These are gifts. James tells us that every good gift in every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation. So do we all get gifts? Do all of us get gifts? Well, Peter says it pretty clearly here, as each has received a gift, each, every believer, for the little ones amongst us here at a big church this morning who trust in Christ, this includes you. God has given you special gifts. For the downtrodden and the depressed, those struggling with self-esteem or self-worth, this includes you. God has gifted you. For the prideful, who like to count your accomplishments, but inwardly have such doubt, this includes you, each one. Oh, but when we start to consider our gifts and the gifts of other, covetousness just abounds. Consider the parable of the talents that Adam read to us. The master gave talents according to each's ability, right? Ten, five, or sorry, five, two, and one. I like to picture that scene. The wealthy master comes in, ready for his long journey. The camels are packed. He's ready to roll, right? And he calls his three top deputies in to give and trust them with talents. As Adam said, a talent is no small thing. We're talking 15, 20 years worth of wages for a day laborer. So imagine being the third one, right? The master comes into the first one. And he says, I'm going to give you five talents. And the third guy is probably thinking, wow, five talents. That's what, 80, 100 years worth of wages? Things are going pretty well here, you know? Start, probably starts thinking, all right, if I get five, I can probably, let's see, I'll, I'll buy a boat, and then with the 4.9, I'll invest it, and th things will work out well, right? And then he moves to the second one, and he says, I'm going to give you two talents. And if we're that third servant, we're probably thinking, oh, that's not headed in the right direction. But yeah, may, maybe I wouldn't give that guy much money anyways. And so, so it gets to him, and the master says, here is one talent. If that was you, wouldn't you say, one, 
I got one and that guy got five? Or the next guy say, hey, I only got two and that guy got five? Or those two start bickering and say, I only got one and that guy got two? Our mind moves immediately to the numbers here, doesn't it? As if it were up to us to be the gift giver. When we compare these varied gifts, these varied graces of God, we begin coveting what the Lord in his divine wisdom has given individually to our brothers and sisters. And we think wicked thoughts. If I had that kind of money, I'd do those things too. If I only had to work three days of work, I'd, I'd volunteer in the kids' ministry as well. If I had the energy of that guy, I'd also read those books and I'd go do the things that he's doing. These are wicked thoughts. We are all given different gifts, possessions, and abilities. So should we take some time to think about what our gifts are? There's so many tests, quizzes, many books on assessing your gifting. I'm sure many of us have used them and perhaps found some value there. But these types of exercises can begin to lose their focus pretty quickly when we just Think of gifts in this very limited way. Like we treat it like a personality test. Am I a type A or am I, am I a type B? Am I an extrovert or am I an introvert? Am I truly gifted in encouraging, like all my friends say, or am I not because I just took two online multiple choice tests and they say that's my least area of gifting? It's as if we feel called to minister through music and we spend so much time trying to think and determine, did God make me more of an electric guitar guy or an acoustic guitar guy? Pick up the guitar and get to work. In due time, you'll figure it out. In due time, you'll realize what instrument you should be playing. But brothers and sisters, you are all given gifts. We have each received gifts from God's varied grace. Grace. So what do we do with them? We steward them. We are stewards of God's varied graces. Peter gives us two examples here to draw on. So let's examine them and see if we can find some elements of what biblical stewardship looks like. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So, for those of you who like really outlined notes, let me give you three sub points here about what stewarding God's varied grace looks like, this loving action of stewardship looks like using our gifts, relying on the giver, and serving others. The first element here may seem like the most obvious at the surface, but it's one that all of us are at risk of failing to accomplish. We begin stewarding God's varied grace by using the gifts entrusted to us. The parable of the talents makes this point perhaps more than any other very clearly. Consider the servant with the single talent. The master returns and that servant was found to have acted out of fear. Burying the talent in the ground. And the master responds with these grave words. You wicked and slothful servant. You should have at least given it to the banker. If you weren't going to steward it, you should have at least entrusted it to someone else to steward. They could have done something with it while you sat idly by. And the master takes away the talent. And he gives it to the one who has ten. And the wicked servant is cast into the outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Stewarding God's gifts, his varied graces to us by using them is part and parcel of the Christian life. They are inextricable. James says, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. If you sit here this morning and say, yes, I'll take the free gift of faith through grace, I'll believe in the gospel of Christ. And then you have no conviction, no compulsion whatsoever to use the manifold graces that God has given you to serve others for his glory. If that's you this morning, I'd ask you to stop and consider, do you truly know him? Have you truly tasted of his love 
It changes everything. Are you the servant with the single talent, biding his time, awaiting the return of the master? Wicked, slothful, and unredeemed? For you children of God who look at your life and you're starting to think, oh my goodness, I do have so many gifts and I, and I steward them so poorly. If you see all the ways that you're failing to use the gifts that God's entrusted to you, let me say this. In our sojourning, we will stumble. We will struggle. In our imperfection, we will imperfectly steward our gifts. But press on. The end of all things is at hand. The king is coming. Secondly, we must use our gifts by relying on the giver. The Lord provides such straight and level paths for us as believers. He gives us the gift and then he gives us the strength to use the gift. What Christ perhaps would call an easy yoke. But in our arrogance, so often we say, hey, okay, I've got this gift. I'll take it from here, Lord. We act in self-reliance rather than God dependence. We leave the nice level path and start struggling through the thickets of our own doing. How do we know if we're doing this? Well, I think back to verse 7 could be, looking at that verse could be helpful for here. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. Okay, so in the use of our gifts, are we being self-controlled? Check, got it. Are we being sober-minded? Yep. Check, got it. Are we in prayer over the use of our gifts? Hmm. If we're not praying as we use our gifts, it is very possible that we are relying on our own strength rather than the gift giver's strength, rather than the Lord's strength. We can see this in the first example here. Whoever speaks is to speak as the one who speaks the oracles of God. Oracles of God, that's kind of an interesting phrase. So if we look to where we can find the oracles of God, Stephen uses this exact phrase when describing Moses, which is great because we've been in been Exodus. We're reading through the oracles of God as spoken and then um, written by Moses. But do you remember Moses? Way back, rewind, rewind past you know, the Ten Commandments, rewind back through the parting of the Red Sea, go back before the plagues and end up with Moses as a shepherd, shepherding his father-in-law's flock. Do you remember when the Lord called him to speak, gave him the gift of speaking, the gift of speaking as the oracles of God? Remember what Moses said? Exodus 4 verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So clearly the speaking is from the Lord, a gift from the Lord, and Moses himself relied on the gift giver. How tragic is it when we attempt to use God's gifting but fail to bring him glory because we do it out of our own strength? How sad to leave the straight and level path he has provided for us. So to be good stewards of God's very grace, we must use our gifts relying on the giver in the service of others. Here we might be able to anticipate what Peter says next. Use our gift, rely on the giver in service of God. That would seem most natural to me, but that's not what he says. We are to use our gifts to serve one another. This horizontal focus starts to help us fit together this whole text like puzzle pieces. We are to love one another, above all. We are to show hospitality to one another, and we are to use our gifts to serve one another. This is the distinguishing mark of Christian fellowship, that we, modeling our saviors, ongoingly lay down our lives in the love and service of one another, his bride. How practical, how loving for the Lord to give us one another. A physical, tangible, constant way of bringing him glory. Glory. 
Should you sit in a quiet room and meditate upon the scriptures? Yes, and amen. But then get up. Go and use the gifts that God has given you. What you have and what you are able to do, relying on him in the service of others. We'll close today by looking at the final point, the glorious outcome. Verse 11 says this, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Anytime we take an action, we of course have in mind the outcome of that action. When we set aside a little money each month for a 401k or a retirement account, we of course have in mind the outcome of having sufficient amount of resources later in life, right? When believers steward God's varied grace, the outcome is nothing short than the glory of God. When we think of glorifying God, a lot of times we're actually thinking of observing his glory or describing his glory. We come and sing about his glory. We teach our kids about his glory. And all these things are wonderful. We meditate, we think on, we dwell upon his glory. But here, Peter points us to another way of bringing God glory in everything. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The neat thing about everything is that it includes every single thing. It's such a beautiful design. If you think about it, it's such an elegant design. When the end comes and the earth and the works that are done on it are exposed, your loving stewardship of God's varied grace will be seen by believers and unbelievers alike. And you know what they'll do? They will glorify God. Peter tells us that in um, chapter 3. That on the day of visitation, the nations, the Gentiles, will see your good deeds and glorify God. Why are they going to bring glory to God for your good deeds? Why wouldn't they glorify you? Well, isn't that clear now? Because it is God that saved you by his grace through faith. It is God that gifted you according to his varied grace. And it is God working through you in everything to put his love on display. So what about us? We get to be conduits of that love. Conduits of his gifting. Stewards of God's varied grace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful passage, for the clear truth that it brings to us, God. God, we thank you for the many promises we have of your coming, your kingdom. God, that we will one day be with you and we'll have no need of the sun because you will shine amongst us where we will no longer have tears, no longer have sin, God. We eagerly await your coming, Lord. God, help us to be a people that lives in light of these great promises of your word, that the end of all things is at hand. Help us not to sit back and be arrogant or slothful and wicked, God, but as a people, Lord, we pray that we would love one another, that we would serve one another, that we as a church body here at Four Corners would be hospitable to one another, that we would fully lay down our lives just as we saw our Savior, our elder brother Christ do for the service of others to your glory, God. I pray that you would use this passage to spur on action in our lives. God, for those amongst us who've not even dealt with or not yet dealt with the gift of grace that you give unto salvation, I pray your word would break through their dead, cold hearts this morning. God, for those of us who are blessed to have received that grace, we ask that you would use our lives in any way that you choose, God. May we surrender all things before you, God. 
We know that in our own strength we will fail, but we trust in your strength, in the inner working of your Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We thank you that you didn't just save us and leave us aside, but that you dwell within us, God, that we may walk in the good works that you have prepared for us. May we do so by your power and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'll be serving communion,